On the late afternoon of December 11, 2006, 30-year-old Rafaela Castagna glanced out the upstairs window of her condo that was located in the center of Urba, a small and well-to-do town in northern Italy. The weather had been beautiful all day, but since she needed to go out to the store to pick up a few things for dinner, she reflexively was looking outside to make sure the sun was still out. When she saw that it was, she turned around, grabbed her coat off of a nearby chair, and then walked into the kitchen to say a quick goodbye to her mother and her two-year-old son, Yusuf. Her mother, 60-year-old Paolo Gali, was sitting in a chair next to little Yusuf, who was busy drawing pictures at the table with thick-colored crayons. Rafaela gave her son a kiss on the head and then asked her mom if there was anything she needed at the store since she'd be there anyways. Paola, who was an attractive woman with light brown hair pushed behind her ears, looked up for a minute from Yusuf's scribbles and told her daughter that maybe she should pick up some clementines and a little cake for Yusuf. And other than that, if Rafaela got the loaf of bread and bottle of wine along with the vegetables they'd need to make pasta that evening, they'd be all set. Rafaela smiled and nodded and then thanked her mom for looking after Yusuf for a bit, and then she turned and headed towards the door of her condo, where she took a shopping bag from the hook off the wall and slipped it over her shoulder. After calling out a final goodbye to her mom and son, Rafaela stepped outside of her apartment onto a narrow balcony that stretched the length of their three-room unit. To her left was the stairway that led both down to the cobblestone courtyard below, and also there was a stairwell that went up to the attic apartment right above her condo, where Mr. and Mrs. Cherubini lived. Before heading for the stairs, Rafaela just walked forward and leaned up against the railing and surveyed the courtyard right in front of her. Her apartment was part of a very old complex of condo units clustered around this rectangular courtyard right in front of her where residents parked their cars. Some of the seven buildings that made up this complex were six stories tall, while others were just three stories tall. Rafaela's apartment was located on the second floor of one of the buildings that had three stories. It was a renovated farmhouse with pale stone walls that looked yellow in the afternoon sun. To her right, at the far end of the courtyard, was a gate that led out to a narrow road called Via Diaz that left the courtyard and wound around the outside of the condo complex and led down to the shops and restaurants in town. The single window in Yusuf's bedroom and the window in the master bedroom that Rafaela shared with her husband looked out over this road via Diaz, and Rafaela's son loved to stand at those windows hoping to catch a glimpse of a big truck as it drove by. From her perch on the balcony, Rafaela looked up and over the roofs of the condo in front of her. In the distance, she could see the purple outline of the Alps, the mountain range that separated her town from their neighbors, France to the east and Switzerland and Austria to the north. But like most of the other 16,000 or so inhabitants of Urba, Rafaela didn't really notice all the beautiful sights around her that made Urba and other small Italian towns popular to tourists. Instead, as she stood there at the balcony railing, all she could think about was just how happy she was now that her family had finally started speaking to each other again. For almost three years, ever since her relationship with her 25-year-old Tunisian husband, Azuz Marzouk, had started getting serious, her father and two brothers had basically stopped talking to her. Rafaela had always been more rebellious than her two brothers, and her family, who were all devout Catholics, had not been happy when she converted to Islam and married Azuz. But when Yusuf was born, Rafaela's mother saw just how much Azuz cared for the little boy, and it changed her mind about him. And in time, she fully accepted her daughter's life decisions, and from that point onward, she did her best to be the most supportive grandmother she could possibly be. And recently, Rafaela's father, Carlos, who owned a successful local furniture company, he had also finally started coming around too. And while of course this made Rafaela extremely happy, it was actually little Yusuf, with his dark hair and dark eyes and bright smile, who was the happiest about this new family dynamic because he adored his grandparents, and his grandparents totally adored him. Recently, Yusuf's grandfather had sent some of his workers over to Rafaela's condo to install some soundproofing. This way, Yusuf could play on the floor of his bedroom with his beloved trucks and push toys without disturbing the neighbors. Yusuf was extremely pleased about this. At some point, Rafaela pushed herself up from the railing, she buttoned her coat, and then she walked down the stairs to the courtyard. As she left the courtyard and turned onto Via Diaz, heading for her favorite local market, Rafaela nodded and smiled at some of her neighbors who were also out for a walk. 
Rafaela enjoyed the chance to walk into town by herself, going as slowly or quickly as she wanted. She had recently landed a good part-time job at an assisted living community for the disabled, and while she loved the work, at times it could be so hectic that it was nice to get away and be alone whenever she could. After making the walk into town, Rafaela got the things she needed from the store, and then she began the walk back home. As she neared the gate that would take her back into the courtyard, Rafaela greeted and waved to a few more neighbors who looked like they were heading into town themselves. Rafaela felt like she knew everyone who lived in her apartment complex, from the friendly volunteer firefighter to the garbage collector and his tiny wife who cleaned houses for a living, to Mrs. Cherubini, who worked in sales, and her husband, 63-year-old Mr. Cherubini, who couldn't wait for his wife to retire. As Rafaela crossed the courtyard and began walking up the steps to her condo, she wondered what her neighbors thought of her when they saw her walk by. When she reached her door, she used her key and she opened it up, and then once she stepped inside, she called out to her mother and to Yusuf to let them know that she was home. Yusuf came pattering down the hallway to greet her. Rafaela scooped him up and gave him a kiss, and then while carrying her son and the groceries, she headed into the kitchen to see her mother. Once she was there, she and her mother chatted while they began preparing dinner, and while Yusuf giggled and ran around knocking over blocks and riding his scooter, the kitchen slowly filled with the smell of olive oil and fresh garlic. A little while later, at about 8.20 p.m. that night, two of Rafaela's neighbors were out for an evening walk. It was a clear night, and the temperature had dropped to a cool 45 degrees Fahrenheit. As the two men stepped out of the courtyard onto Via Diaz, they followed the road as it turned right and brought them right alongside the backside of the building that Rafaela's apartment was in. As the two men walked, one of them smelled smoke and looked up at the building right next to them, and they could see flames licking against the glass of one of the windows in Rafaela's apartment. After signaling the other neighbor to look up as well, they watched as the glass broke from the heat of the fire, and then smoke began pouring out into the night air. Both men immediately sprang into action. They turned around and they raced back into the courtyard. And as they ran, they pulled out their phones to call the fire department that was located just over a mile away. As they raced up the stairs and then reached the second floor landing, they saw a very badly injured man laying on the ground right in front of them. The door to Rafaela's burning apartment was open and the injured man was laying across the threshold. His head was inside the apartment and his legs were outside on the landing. The two neighbors rushed over and grabbed the man's ankles and dragged him as far from the open door as they could. As they did, they heard a woman's scream coming from the attic apartment that was located directly above Rafaela's apartment. It was clear the upstairs apartment had caught fire as well. The injured man nodded his head helplessly towards the outside stairs that led up to this attic apartment. But when the two neighbors looked up at the third floor and saw the apartment above, there was so much smoke and fire coming out of the windows that they knew it would have been suicide to try to go up there and save whoever was screaming. And so with no time to feel bad about that, the two neighbors turned their focus to the open doorway to Rafaela's apartment. One of the men stepped inside the very smoky apartment, and after taking only a few steps, he saw there was a woman lying motionless on the ground, and her skin and clothes were on fire. As the neighbors pulled her out onto the landing by her ankles and tried to extinguish the flames on her, they looked up and saw the fire inside of Rafaela's apartment had finally reached the front entryway. So the men knew that even if there were more people trapped inside of Rafael's apartment, there was no way they could get to them. By the time the fire department arrived just minutes later, the terrible screaming in the attic apartment had stopped, and the two neighbors, who were now coughing and filthy, could see that the woman they had pulled from the apartment who had been on fire was 30-year-old Rafaela Castagna, and she was dead. As the firefighters and emergency medical personnel took over, the two neighbors who had done their best to save the people in the fire stumbled back down the stairs and out into the courtyard, shocked and horrified by what they had just seen and experienced. Meanwhile, both the courtyard and the street running alongside the back of the condo via Diaz were filling up with neighbors and curious bystanders. Some were taking pictures with their phones, but most just stared upward at the firefighters climbing up the ladder truck trying to make their way into the burning apartment. Once the fire was finally out, medical personnel and police went inside to see if anyone else had been in there, and unfortunately there had been. 
One by one, three more bodies were brought outside. The first was Rafaela's mother, Paula, who had been found halfway down the hallway that connected the entrance of the condo to the kitchen and living area. The second was the Castagna's 55-year-old neighbor, Mrs. Cherubini, who had been the woman screaming in the attic apartment. And the third and final stretcher that came out carried the small body of Rafaela's two-year-old son, Yusuf. The only survivor, Mr. Cherubini, who had been pulled out onto the landing by the two men who first reported the blaze, he had been rushed to the hospital in the nearby city of Como, and it was unclear if he was going to survive. Late on the night of the fire, Rafaela's father learned the terrible news. In a voice so choked with tears that you could barely understand what he was saying, Carlos called Rafaela's two brothers and told them, your mother and sister and Yusuf, their neighbor, Mrs. Cherubini, they are dead. All four of them are dead. After the four bodies were loaded into ambulances and taken to the medical examiner's office where a doctor would perform autopsies to determine the cause of death, police tried unsuccessfully to disperse the crowd of spectators in the courtyard and out on the road on the other side of the condo. So instead, police just used yellow tape to set up a clear perimeter around the burned out apartment to at least keep people at a distance. As the police and arson investigators, who were dressed in full body protective gear, started lugging lights and equipment into the ruined unit, the mood amongst the residents who were still gathered outside in the courtyard quickly turned from shock to concern. Neighbors began speculating about how the fire could have started and spread so quickly, and how none of the victims appeared to have even tried to escape or call for help. Soon, neighbors were wondering out loud if there was more to these tragic deaths than just an accidental house fire. But the police and other authority figures who were on scene were not speculating, and the two neighbors who had been first on the scene and who might have been able to give the residents more information, they were not there to answer any questions either because they had gone to the police station to tell law enforcement what they had seen. But within 72 hours, the worst fears of the Castagna's neighbors were confirmed. The initial investigation by police and arson inspectors, along with an examination of the four bodies, revealed that the victims had actually been murdered and that the apartment had been set on fire to cover up evidence of what the Italian press had dubbed the Urba Massacre. In the initial police reconstruction of the crime, Mr. and Mrs. Cherubini, the Castagna's neighbors who lived above them in the attic apartment, they had likely smelled smoke and had rushed down the outside stairs from their apartment to the Castagna's to see if something was wrong. But once they reached that second floor landing, the Cherubinis must have stumbled into the perpetrator who had just killed Rafaela, her mother, and Yusuf and set the fire and was now trying to flee. And so the murderer must have seen the Cherubinis and attacked, first striking Mr. Cherubini down, leaving him for dead in the doorway, and then chasing Mrs. Cherubini back up the stairs into her attic apartment, where the murderer attacked her too, leaving her trapped and incapacitated before the fire killed her. Given that the first body found inside of Rafaela's apartment was Rafaela, and that the door did not show any signs of a forced entry, Police suspected that Rafaela must have recognized the perpetrator and opened the door for them. The only person who could confirm or deny any of these details was Mr. Cherubini, and while he had survived the attack, after reaching the hospital, he had fallen into a coma, and so he had not been able to tell police or anybody what had actually happened. After the news broke about the murders, the police flooded Rafaela's apartment complex and began interviewing everyone. Did the Castagnas have any enemies? Did you see anyone strange walking around the apartment complex that night? Did you see any of the Castagnas that night? And if so, what were they doing or who were they talking to? But even as investigators carried out these constant interviews with neighbors and continued sifting through all of the evidence in the burned out apartment for clues to the killer's identity, the investigators' real attention was actually focused on Rafaela's husband, Azuz. He had not been home at the time of the fire and his whereabouts were unknown. Police weren't the only ones to suspect Azuz, as everyone in Urba seemed to know, 
Rafaela's husband had only recently been released from prison that year under a mass pardon by the government. Azuz had been serving time for dealing drugs, and so the investigators and people in Urba were suspicious that his drug ties may have had something to do with the murders. And the Italian media seemed to think the same thing. And so they quickly began running these stories that more or less declared that Azuz was either involved in the murders or that he was the murderer. But it would turn out Azuz had a rock-solid alibi. Within a few days of the murders, Azuz arrived back in Urba from his parents' home in Tunisia, where he said he had been visiting at the time of the murders. He said as soon as he heard that his family had been killed, he jumped on a plane and headed back to Italy. But even with this rock-solid alibi, the police still felt like Azuz could be a suspect, but without any evidence to support this theory, they did have to start looking elsewhere. So without any other leads to chase down, investigators again turned to the Castagna's neighbors in hopes of finding any new information that could help them solve this case, which by now had become a major national media sensation. And when the police went back, for the most part, people had really nice things to say about the Castagna's. But as police dug deeper and deeper and asked people more and more questions, they eventually started hearing about a feud that the Castagnas had with their next door neighbors, Olindo and his wife Rosa. Olindo was a large, awkward, and shy man who left early each day for his job as a garbage collector, and Rosa was a tiny, dark-haired woman whose house cleaning services were very much in demand. Now, when the police learned that this potential feud the Castagnas had was with Olindo and Rosa, they almost didn't follow up because they had already spoken to this totally unassuming, quiet couple, and they learned that they were gone at the time of the fire and whenever the murders happened, and like everyone else, they had seemed very upset about what happened to the Castagnas, and, you know, whatever issues they had with the Castagnas had to be fairly minor. But at this point, the police had so little to go on, they decided they would follow up and they would ask the middle-aged couple to come into the station for another round of questioning. And so the couple happily agreed, and before long, they were sitting in a room at the station ready to talk about whatever the police wanted. And over the course of the subsequent conversation, this couple would tell a truly unbelievable story that would not only shock the police, it would shock the world. Based on their story and on subsequent evidence and testimony that their story helped uncover, the police were able to piece together almost exactly what happened to the victims. On December 11th, so the night of the attack, just before 8 p.m., which was a couple of hours after Rafaela had returned from the market and had made dinner with her mother while Yusuf played on the floor around them, Two people walked up the outdoor flight of stairs that led to the second floor landing where Rafaela's apartment was. To understand what happens next, you need to have an understanding of the layout of Rafaela's apartment. Once you step through the front door and you go into the apartment, you would be standing in the middle of a hallway that stretched out to the left and to the right. The longer part of the hallway ran off to the left towards the combination kitchen and the living room area at the far end of the unit. Between the front door and the living room kitchen area, there was another doorway on the right side of the hall that led into Yusuf's little bedroom. If you turned right when you first walked into the hallway after coming into the apartment, you would almost immediately come to a closed door that led into the master bedroom. At exactly 8 p.m., the two people got off the stairs on the second floor landing and came to a stop directly in front of Rafaela's apartment door. Once there, they each reached down and touched the outside of their coat pockets, confirming that what was supposed to be in there was still there. Then they each pulled rubber gloves from those pockets and spent a few moments pulling first one set of gloves onto each of their hands and then a second set. Once they were ready, one of these two people rang the doorbell and then they both leaned forward a few inches, straining to hear the sound of footsteps coming towards the door so they would be prepared for when it opened. Less than a minute later, they heard Rafaela's voice on the other side of the door asking who was there. One of the two people out on the landing calmly identified themselves and gave their reason for being there. After just a moment's hesitation, Rafaela opened the door. Instantly, one of the two people on the balcony, who were the attackers, pulled a heavy metal bar with a sharpened tip out of their jacket pocket. They lunged forward and they delivered a savage blow to Rafaela's head. 
As soon as Rafaela fell to the floor, her attacker reached into their jacket pocket and pulled out a sharp kitchen knife. Then they rushed forward until they were standing directly over Rafaela, and they reached down and they slit her throat from ear to ear. As Rafaela grasped at her neck trying to stop the blood that was now pouring out of her, her attacker proceeded to stab her 11 more times. After this, the two attackers stepped over Rafaela's body, and then they turned left and began walking down the long hallway toward the kitchen and living area. As they pushed aside a child's scooter and toy trucks, they came face to face with Rafaela's 60-year-old mother. Paola had left the living room couch where she was sitting next to her grandson and was calling out in a panicked voice to her daughter, asking what was going on. Without hesitation, the same attacker who had just savagely attacked Rafaela raised the same sharpened metal bar and swung it at Paola's head. But the grandmother put up a fight, raising her arms to shield herself from this blow before pushing the attackers as hard as she could back down the hallway. However, the two attackers eventually overpowered Paola and they knocked her to the floor. And as soon as she hit the ground, one of the attackers leaned down and made a deep slash across the woman's throat. At the same time that was happening, the other attacker stepped past Rafaela's mother and headed into the small living area where two-year-old Yusuf, still dressed in his trousers, socks, and a brightly patterned top, sat too terrified to make a sound alone on the small sofa. He watched as his murderer walked up to him, leaned forward, and with their weapon held in their left hand, they grabbed his shoulder and then a moment later they slid the point of the knife into the little boy's throat. With the entire family either dead or dying, the attackers turned and began walking back down the hallway back towards the front door. On their way, they poured lighter fluid on Paola and her daughter Rafaela. They also sprayed lighter fluid all over Yusuf's bedroom and the master bedroom. Then the attackers lit three separate fires around the apartment before heading for the front door. But as the attackers stepped out onto the second floor balcony, they heard footsteps pounding down the enclosed stairway right above them. It was Mr. and Mrs. Cherubini. They had indeed smelled smoke and they were coming down to help their neighbors. Taken by surprise, the attackers responded with immediate savage force. As one of the attackers slashed the throat of Mr. Cherubini, leaving him to bleed out where he fell part way across the threshold of Raffaella's condo, the other attacker took off after Mrs. Cherubini, who had begun running, terrified, back up the steps to her attic apartment. By the time Mrs. Cherubini had managed to get back through the door of her own home, where police would find her dead, kneeling on the floor with her head in her hands, she had suffered eight blows to the head and 34 stab wounds to her back and thighs. The only reason Mr. Cherubini did not die from this attack was because of a congenital malformation of his carotid artery that stopped him from bleeding out before emergency medical personnel had arrived and could take him to the hospital. By 8.15 p.m., the two killers had finished their work. They had stuffed their bloody gloves back into the pockets of their coats, they had gone back down the stairway that led into the courtyard, and they had disappeared. Just five minutes later, the two men who had been walking past Rafaela's apartment that evening along Via Diaz, they would look up and they would see flames and smoke starting to pour out of the second story apartment window and they would run back and discover the gruesome scene. The reason Olindo and Rosa's story was so shocking to police and the reason it filled in all of these gaps about what happened was because their story was actually just a detailed confession. The shy garbage collector and his tiny wife, who was obsessed with quiet and cleanliness, were the killers. Olindo confessed to killing Rafaela and her mother and slashing the throat of Mr. Cherubini. The details of Mrs. Cherubini's death are unclear, but Rosa would tell police that she remembered chasing Mrs. Cherubini back up the stairs, and as the terrified woman scrambled to get back into her apartment, Rosa recalled making an upward stab with her knife into the back of Mrs. Cherubini's thigh. As for little Yusuf, Rosa, showing no emotion, told police that she was the one who slit the boy's throat. When asked why they did this, Olindo and Rosa, who did not have children of their own and who seemed not only socially withdrawn but morbidly attached to one another, said that they could not stand the noise that their neighbors, the Castanias, made while going about their daily lives. 
And once Yusuf was born, the sound of him crying at night and playing with his toys and riding his scooter and sometimes screaming in toddler frustration was just too much for Rosa and her husband. According to a transcript of this confession, Rosa would say, We just couldn't stand them anymore. He was always screaming and my head was exploding. Rosa and Olindo's issues with the Castañas came to a head on the afternoon of December 31st, 2005, roughly one year before the murders. On the second floor landing right outside of Rafaela's apartment, Olindo and Rosa confronted Rafaela and her mother, Paula, about the noise coming from their apartment. And at some point during this confrontation, as Rosa swore and cussed out Rafaela, her husband, Olindo, wound up and hit Rafaela, knocking her to the floor where she hit her head hard on the concrete. Before Rafaela could even get to her feet, Rosa and Olindo were hustling away back down the stairs, and as they did this, Rosa would call over her shoulder, Do not dare report us or we will make you pay. But immediately after this assault, Rafaela contacted a lawyer and began talking about filing a complaint against the couple. Rafaela's father, Carlos, had tried to mediate a settlement between his daughter and this couple. He also had that soundproofing installed in Rafaela's apartment because he wanted his grandson, Yusuf, to be able to just keep playing like a little kid and not have anyone get mad about it. But nothing worked and Olindo and Rosa continued to complain and cause problems. And so finally, not long before the murders occurred, Rafaela went ahead and filed a lawsuit against her neighbors. However, she did tell them she would drop it if they just paid her family 5,000 euros, or about $6,850. Furious and absolutely unwilling to pay, Olindo and Rosa decided that they would just have to murder the Castañas instead. On the night of the attack, so December 11th, 2006, when Rafaela came to the door and asked who was there, Rosa and Olindo called back and said that they were there to accept the terms of Rafaela's proposed monetary settlement. Knowing full well, as soon as that door opened, they were going to murder Rafaela, they were going to murder her mother, her child, and anyone else who got in their way. After leaving the burning condo, Olindo and Rosa had gone back to their own home, disposed of their bloody gloves and weapons, they put their bloody clothes in the wash, they showered and dressed, and then they went out to a local restaurant, so it would appear that they had not been around when the crime was discovered. But, as Rafaela knew from her own experience, there are no secrets in small towns, and after the murders were discovered, many neighbors noticed that Olindo and Rosa did not seem all that upset about these horrible murders that had taken place, and they didn't seem remotely scared about the idea that there could be a killer or killers still on the loose. So that, combined with the fact that everyone in the complex knew about Olindo and Rosa's feud with the victims, had led several neighbors to tip off police that maybe they should look into this unassuming couple. And when the case against Rafaela's husband, Azuz, fell apart because he was totally innocent and had an alibi, this is exactly what the police did. Although the killers would later withdraw their very detailed confessions, the details they provided to police, combined with the fact that Mr. Cherubini would eventually come out of his coma and he would positively identify Olindo and Rosa as his attackers, was enough to send the couple to trial on October 12, 2008, almost two years after the Urba massacre. At their trial, the police would explain that they bugged Olindo and Rosa's home with listening devices shortly after neighbors had brought up their suspicions around this couple. And so within days of the murders, Rosa was overheard on one of these listening devices saying to Olindo, see how peaceful it is now? We can finally sleep well. On November 26, 2008, Olindo and Rosa were found guilty of first degree murder they were each sentenced to life in prison, where for the first three years, they would spend every daylight hour in solitary confinement. The United States formally entered World War II in December of 1941, following the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by the Japanese. Roughly six months later, a 21-year-old Alabama native named Henry Irwin joined the Army Reserve. After nearly two years of additional military training, Henry was made into a radio operator and was assigned to a B-29 bomber. 
A B-29 bomber is this huge aircraft whose sole purpose is to drop bombs. And so in February of 1945, Henry and his B-29 bomber unit were sent to the Pacific to do just that, drop bombs on the Japanese. Two months after arriving, Henry's B-29 was tasked with being the lead bomber in a group attack on a Japanese chemical facility located about 125 miles north of Tokyo. Aside from just operating his radio inside of the B-29, occasionally Henry's job was to organize the other planes in the attack when their B-29 was the lead attacker. And so the way he would do this was by dropping a series of smoke bombs out of his plane, and then once they touched the ground and all the smoke was coming up, he would hop on his radio and communicate with the other pilots in his sortie and tell them to organize themselves off of this visual reference point on the ground. He would basically have them fly to certain positions relative to the smoke cloud. And so once all the pilots had been organized into proper formation, they would continue to their target and commence their bombing raid. For this mission, Henry was in his typical position right behind the front turret gun towards the front of the plane. When his pilot told him to start dropping smoke bombs, Henry did as he was told. And so he pulled the lever, which opened up a chute on the bottom of the plane, and all these smoke bombs began tumbling out of it. Now, as soon as he pulled that lever, all of the smoke bombs that were in that particular chute were ignited. They were on a timed fuse, and so they would tumble out of the plane, and then before hitting the ground, they would ignite, and then smoke would start billowing out of them. But for some reason, after he pulled that lever, a couple of the smoke bombs fell out of the chute, but one of them kind of got turned around, and as it tumbled down, it kind of caught itself on the lip and bounced back up into the plane, and it struck Henry square in the face, shattering his nose, and then it ignited and literally lit Henry's face on fire, which instantly blinded him. Smoke bombs are not considered lethal devices because they do not explode the way typical bombs do. However, make no mistake about it, you would not want to be near a military-grade smoke bomb when it went off. In order for it to emit that very thick and long-lasting smoke that it does, the smoke bomb ignites a chemical fire within itself that burns extremely hot. And so when the smoke bomb came back inside the plane and ignited right in front of Henry, those chemicals landed on his face, and so that's why he caught on fire. And if that wasn't bad enough, the smoke bomb also filled the plane completely with smoke, making it impossible for the pilots to see anything. Despite his burning, shattered face, all Henry could think about was if he didn't get this smoke bomb off the plane, in the next few seconds, they were all going to crash and die. So instead of trying to put out his burning face, Henry began feeling around on the ground for the smoke bomb, which again is basically like a fireball. And when he found it, he pulled it into his chest, trying to smother it as best as he could. And while his body completely engulfed in flames, Henry began low crawling his way towards the front of the plane where he knew just by touch, there was going to be a window. And so as he agonizingly crawled, he's on fire, he finally gets to this window, he can feel it above him, and he manages to lift the smoke bomb up and throws it out the window. And then afterwards, he collapses on the ground and he passes out completely on fire, fully expecting to die. A few seconds later, the smoke inside of the plane cleared because now the smoke bomb was gone, and the pilot who had put the plane on autopilot but did have to drop significantly in altitude because they were starting to stall, finally could see again and saw they were about 300 feet from hitting the water. And so he was able to pull back and get them out of their dive, and he narrowly escaped crashing into the water, and he turned around and began flying back to base. On this return trip, the crew, who were unhurt, began assessing the damage and they saw Henry on fire on the side of the plane. And so they rushed over and they put him out with a fire extinguisher, expecting him to be dead. But to their shock and horror, he was still alive. And so they gave him morphine for his pain and expected him to die any moment. But Henry didn't die. Instead, he was very cheerful on the flight all the way back to base. And he would ask each of his crew members if they were okay. And they would all say, yeah, I'm just fine. It's really you who we're concerned about here. When the pilot finally landed back at base, Henry's body had stiffened up so dramatically from being on fire that the doctors couldn't actually get him out of the plane's side door. And so they had to dismantle the side of the plane to get Henry out. And so the doctors fully expected Henry was going to die basically any moment from his horrible wounds. But since he hadn't yet, they did everything they could to try to save him. 
They put him through dozens of surgeries, including one where they would try to remove the chemical flex from the smoke bomb that had embedded in his eyes. And since these chemicals combusted as soon as they made contact with oxygen, every time they pulled out one of these flex, it would burst into flames and very painfully burn Henry's eyes a little bit more. While Henry was undergoing all these surgeries, the rest of his B-29 crew immediately went to their commanding officer and said, you have to put Henry in for the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is the highest award you can achieve in the US military. After the commanding officer heard the story of what Henry had done, he agreed and in record time, he got the paperwork processed and got Henry approved for this award. But there were no actual physical medals of honor on the island to actually present to Henry. And the officers and the rest of his crew were worried Henry would die before the actual medal was shipped out to the island to be given to him. And so the only medal of honor that was on this island was inside of a museum behind a glass case. And so one of the officers in Henry's crew went into the museum, shattered the case, took the display medal of honor and rushed to Henry's bedside and put it around his neck. And then after that, somehow Henry just didn't die. After dozens and dozens of surgeries, Henry actually regained sight in one of his eyes and regained the use of most of his body. Henry would later be asked in an interview what it was like to do this very heroic thing that he did. And he would say, well, you know, I only moved the bomb 13 feet, but 13 feet feels like 13 miles when you're on fire. Henry would go on to be honorably discharged from the military, and he would spend the next 37 years working closely with other burn victims, trying to keep them positive and optimistic about their recovery. He would also go on to have four children, one of which became an Alabama state senator. In 2002, Henry died of natural causes at the age of 80. Our next story is called Mad Jack. In 1926, Jack Churchill graduated from one of the UK's most prestigious military academies called Sandhurst, thus becoming an army officer. His first assignment was to an infantry unit stationed in Burma, but when he got there, it was peacetime, so Jack didn't have much to do. But instead of just sitting around all day, Jack did what any other restless young military officer would do, and he mastered the bagpipes, despite being 0% Scottish. He also took a trip across the entire Indian subcontinent on his motorcycle, almost entirely on unpaved roads. But in 1936, despite these incredible side hobbies, he just wasn't really that interested in being a part of the military when there wasn't anything going on, and so he decided to get out. He moved to Nairobi, Kenya, where he became a newspaper editor slash male model slash movie extra. During his off time, he still took his bagpiping very seriously, placing second in a prominent piping competition in 1938. He also picked up another hobby, archery, and he became so good at it so quickly that he was chosen by England to represent them in the Archery World Championships in 1939. Later that same year, when World War II broke out, Jack decided now's a good time to get back into the army. So he rejoined the army and he was promptly sent to France to help defend their borders against a potential Nazi invasion. But shortly after Jack arrived, Hitler was able to push through those defenses and he launched a brutal Blitzkrieg campaign against the Allies in France. Blitzkrieg is a military tactic that's basically an all-out attack all at once with everything you got. So planes, tanks, artillery, infantry, you just send all of it in an attempt to overwhelm your enemy before you run out of resources. And in this case, Hitler's Blitzkrieg was successful. In just six weeks, they not only invaded France, they conquered it. But during that six-week battle for France that the Allies ultimately lost, Jack made a name for himself by employing two particular weapons that nobody else in World War II was using. He is the only one who used these weapons for the entirety of World War II. Jack and two other infantrymen were up on this hill overlooking this town that was full of Nazis. And at some point, five Nazis come running out to the edge of this town and they duck behind a wall that's about 30 meters away from Jack. And one of these Nazis stands up and quickly crumples to the ground. And his four Nazi comrades look to see what happened to him. And they see a dead man on the ground with the back end of an arrow jutting out of his chest. And that arrow was fired by none other than Jack Churchill. Because for the duration of World War II, he didn't carry a gun. He didn't need a gun. Instead, he carried a bow and arrow and a long broadsword. Although periodically he would scoop the weapons up off of dead enemy soldiers and he would fire those. 
When asked why he didn't just carry a gun in the first place, he responded, any officer that goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. From then on, he became Mad Jack, and his peers loved him, but his leadership hated him. They said he was setting a terrible example, that no one should be running around with a sword and a bow and arrow, but he was so effective, they let him continue. Throughout the brutal six-week battle for France, Jack would lead dozens of these small raids against the Nazis, and he would just pick them off one by one with his bow and arrow and with his sword. And in one particular raid, he got shot through the neck, but he was so nonchalant about it that when he got back to base, someone was like, hey, Jack, you're bleeding. And he was like, oh yeah, I am. They were like, well, what happened? He's like, ah, machine gun. After the Allies finally lost this battle for France and were forced to evacuate, they found a diary from one of the British soldiers, and in it he talks about the one thing that motivated him and the other troops around him. And that was the sight of Mad Jack running hither and thither with his bow and arrow and his broadsword. For his bravery in France, Jack was awarded the Military Cross. After leaving France, Jack heard about this new unit, the Commandos, that was being stood up to aggressively sabotage Nazi operations, and they were looking for volunteers. And Jack didn't know much about what they were going to do, but they promised combat, and so he was all for it, and he volunteered. The commando unit would go on to become the famous British Special Forces, and the training they put Jack and the other volunteers through was absolutely brutal. And Jack just loved it. He loved being in the commandos. After graduation in 1941, Jack was put in command of a commando unit that was tasked with going to this Norwegian town of Vogsoy and taking down a Nazi garrison there. And so they loaded up into their amphibious landing craft and Jack's got his kilt on and he's got his bagpipes and he plays the bagpipes on the entire transit over to Vogsoy to pump up the commandos. And then Jack's landing craft was the first to reach the shores and when its ramp came down, Jack was the first off and he just kept playing his bagpipes despite the fact that the Nazis now see them and they're shooting at him. So rounds are impacting around him as he's blaring his bagpipes and only when he finished his song did he shoulder his bagpipes, pull out a grenade, he saw some Nazis running along the ridge line. He throws a grenade at them and pulls out his sword and runs into battle. In just a few hours, the Nazi garrison had fallen and Jack was awarded his second military cross. During the Italian amphibious landings in 1943, Jack again was in charge of a commando unit and they were tasked with capturing a Nazi observation post that was in this town just outside of Salerno. It was well defended and fortified and Jack and his men were outnumbered 20 to 1. So Jack came up with a genius plan. Instead of using stealth tactics, he broke his small team into six different groups and he placed them all around the outside of this town. And it was nighttime, so the Nazis did not see them setting up. And then on Jack's call, he had them all yell out at the exact same time, Commando! And the Nazis in the town were so caught off guard by all this yelling coming from all around them, they assumed a huge force is coming to take over this town. And so they went on the defensive. And so after their big war cry, Jack and his group are the first to charge down into this town and Jack and one other guy would actually splinter off and they would discover this big group of Nazis that were setting up their mortars. And so Jack and this guy sneak up behind one of them and Jack grabs him from behind, holds this sword to his throat and orders him to tell the rest of the team to surrender. And so the rest of the team, who vastly outnumber Jack and the other guy, they turn around and they see this lunatic wearing a kilt, wielding a sword. He's got bagpipes slung over his shoulder along with a bow and arrow. And they're like, okay, we give up. Shortly after, the rest of the Nazis in this town would surrender to Jack and his men. And for his actions, Jack would be awarded the Distinguished Service Order. In 1944, Jack was in Yugoslavia with the commandos trying to capture a strategically valuable location called Point 62. And when every man in his team was either killed or severely wounded, and when Jack had run out of arrows, instead of surrendering, he pulled out his bagpipes and started playing until a grenade detonated behind him, knocking him unconscious. The Nazis captured him and sent him to Berlin to be interrogated because they believed, because of his last name, Churchill, that he was connected to or related to the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He wasn't, not at all, so they ordered Jack to be sent to a concentration camp. On his way out of Berlin, Jack secretly flicked a lit cigarette butt into one of his interrogator's offices, and he lit it on fire, but nobody knew it was him. 
And so Jack arrives at this concentration camp and he's only there for a couple of months before he and another British military officer manage to escape by crawling underneath one of the barbed wire fences. They had slowly burrowed a tunnel without anybody noticing. And then they jumped down into this abandoned drainage pipe and they crawled out to freedom that way. But their freedom would be short-lived because they only made it a couple of miles before they were recaptured by the Nazis. And so they were ordered to go to another concentration camp that was considered much more secure. But after only having been at this new concentration camp for less than a year, once again, Jack was able to escape. This time it was because there was a power outage at the camp and Jack just put his shovel down and casually walked out the front gates and nobody noticed. He walked 150 miles in the treacherous terrain of the Alps, surviving on vegetables he had stolen from people's gardens. And then finally, eight days later, he came across a United States armored division and they took him in and reconnected him with British troops. And then he was ultimately sent back to England. And while Jack was free, he was very frustrated that the war in Europe was effectively over and he had missed most of it. And so he requested a transfer to go out to Burma to fight against the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. But as soon as he got there, the Americans had just dropped the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan, abruptly ending World War II. And when Jack heard about this, he was so disappointed he would not get to do any more fighting. He was quoted as saying, ah, if it wasn't for those Yanks, we could have kept this war going for another 10 years. Even though the war was over, Jack desperately wanted to get into combat at least one more time. And so he went to jump school and qualified as a parachutist at the age of 40. And with this new qualification, he was assigned to a light infantry unit and they were deployed to Palestine to train their army how to better fight the Arab forces. And while he was there, he gained even more fame when he defended a Jewish medical convoy from an Arab ambush. And he did this all while wearing a kilt. Another time, he and 12 of his men helped evacuate 700 people from a Jewish hospital that was under attack from Arab forces. After Palestine, Jack came back to England and eventually retired from the army and then begrudgingly took a desk job within the Ministry of Defense. And every day on his commute home on the train, he would take his briefcase and throw it out the window as they were moving. What he had figured out was if he threw it at the exact right moment, it would land in the backyard of his house and he wouldn't need to carry his briefcase from the station to his house. But he didn't explain that to any of the other passengers on the train. They just figured there's some crazy guy who keeps throwing his briefcases out the window. In his retirement, he also became an extremely talented surfer. And at one point he wanted to surf the Severn Boar, which is this huge wave in Southwestern England that nobody else had surfed before. And locals that were familiar with this treacherous wave, they cautioned him and said, you really shouldn't do this. And he looked at them and he just said, eh, I'll be all right. And then he proceeded to be the first person ever to successfully ride that wave. Jack would ultimately die in 1996. He was 89 years old. The next and final story of today's episode is called Real Life Superhero. The United States formally entered World War II on December 8, 1941, after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. At the time, Joseph Byerly was a senior at his high school in Muskegon, Michigan, and he had a scholarship to attend Notre Dame University the next year. But after his graduation in 1942, he decided he didn't want to go to college so long as other kids his age were going off to fight the war. And so he enlisted in the army, and he immediately volunteered for one of the most dangerous units, the Parachute Infantry. Joseph completed a brutal accelerated training regimen that included exhausting PT and blistering heat, extended forced marches, grueling full kit runs up mountains, as well as both American and British jump schools. By 1943, Joseph was fully trained and stationed in England and was eager to put his training to the test. But the Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied France, also known as D-Day, was still a few months away. But Joseph didn't want to wait that long, so he volunteered for an incredibly dangerous mission that the OSS was recruiting paratroopers for. The OSS was the predecessor to the CIA. Basically, volunteers would parachute in the middle of the night into Nazi-occupied France with a backpack full of gold. Once they hit the ground, they'd meet up with the French resistance and give the gold to them, and then the resistance would do their best to protect these volunteer paratroopers and hopefully give them a ride back out to England. 
but by no means was it a guarantee because many of these volunteers were killed in the process. This was some hardcore deep cover spy work that the OSS would tell their volunteers, if you get caught on this mission, you're gonna get tortured and you're gonna get executed. Joseph would successfully complete this insane mission and then he liked it so much, he did it again. Shortly after his second successful OSS mission, word came down that D-Day was set to take place on June 6th. Joseph's unit was told they were gonna be parachuted into France the night before in order to destroy bridges, cut power supply lines, and generally soften up defenses before the main invasion happened just a couple of hours later at Utah Beach. So in the dead of night on June 5th, Joseph and his unit were flying over France when they were struck by enemy fire. And so as their plane is literally falling to the ground, Joseph leaps out the door when he's only 400 feet off the ground, and he manages to survive the jump as parachute inflated just in time, but he landed on top of a church where a Nazi sniper was up in the steeple taking shots at all of the other paratroopers. And when the sniper saw Joseph on the roof, he began taking shots at him and Joseph managed to dodge the rounds before slipping off the roof and running out of sight. Completely alone with no idea where the rest of his unit was, Joseph took off running from the church and once again had to dodge more sniper fire and he eventually made it to the town's power substation, which he blew up with thermite. So he cut the power to the town and from there he went building to building to building, killing every Nazi he came across, including an entire squad of Nazi infantry that he ambushed with grenades. At some point, Joseph made his way over to one of the bridges leading into this town that if he blew up, it would prevent Nazis from sending reinforcements to Utah Beach. But as he crawled through one of the hedgerows, he fell headfirst into a Nazi machine gun nest. And when he turned around, there were a bunch of machine guns pointed at his face. And so he surrendered. Joseph was marched deeper into France to a POW holding area, and as soon as he got there, explosions ripped out all around him. It wasn't clear if it was German artillery or American aircraft, but whatever it was, it was killing both Germans and American POWs. Joseph took shrapnel to the leg and was blown into a ditch, and despite being in excruciating pain, he took this as an opportunity to escape. And so he got up and ran away as best as he could with his injury, and for 12 hours he remained uncaught behind enemy lines before he was ultimately caught again. This time they put Joseph in the back of a covered locked truck to keep him from escaping, and they decided they would send him to St. Lo and decide what to do with him there. But on their transit to St. Lo, an allied aircraft strafed the vehicle that Joseph was in, and Joseph survived the attack and was able to leap out of one of the holes in the side of the truck from this attack, and he attempted to escape. But once again, he was caught. The Nazis finally got Joseph to St. Lo, and as soon as they got there, the Americans launched an all-night bombing campaign on the city. But once again, Joseph narrowly survives. A recurring theme of Joseph's story is that he is repeatedly almost killed by his own teammates. For the next few days, Joseph was interrogated 20 to 24 hours a day, but he didn't give them any information and he repeatedly called them sons of bitches until they got so fed up with him, they just beat him to a pulp and he was knocked unconscious and kept in the hospital for several days. For the next three months, Joseph was starved, beaten, interrogated some more and moved to multiple POW camps. He'd be forced to do backbreaking labor all day. At night, he would survive allied bombing runs and he would constantly weather hunger, disease, and exhaustion. At one point, he was locked inside of this boxcar with 50 other guys he could barely move inside of it. And once again, it was strafed by allied planes and he was one of the very few people to survive that. In September of 1944, Joseph was moved to a Russian POW camp in Poland that held about 12,000 Russian men and women POWs. And as soon as he got there, he immediately began planning his escape. Two months later, on a freezing night in November, Joseph, along with three other American POWs, managed to cut the barbed wire and snuck out of the camp and began making their escape south. They snuck into a railway station and hopped on a train car they believed was headed for Poland. Their plan was to meet up with the Soviet Red Army as it pushed through the region. But unfortunately, they got on the wrong train and they wound up in Berlin, the capital of Nazi Germany. One thing you don't hear much about when it comes to World War II is there was actually a large number of Germans that hated Hitler and totally disagreed with the Nazis. And so they organized a German underground resistance that was designed to help the Allies during the war. And so when Joseph and the other three American POWs arrived in Berlin, still wearing their POW uniforms, a member of the German resistance saw them and immediately grabbed them and brought them into hiding. 
But after only a week, the infamous Nazi secret police, AKA the Gestapo, discovered them and arrested them. Over the next 10 days, Joseph and the other American POWs got to see firsthand just how awful the Gestapo really were. They were constantly interrogated while they were beaten, kicked, walked on, strung up by their arms backwards. They were hit with whips, clubs, and rifle butts until they drifted into unconsciousness. And then as soon as they started to come to, it would start all over again. After those 10 days, the Gestapo turned Joseph and the other three American POWs over to the German army, who put them in the brutal prison camp called the Stalag Luft III. Upon arrival, Joseph was immediately sentenced to 30 days inside of a four by five foot pine box that was too small to stand up or lay down in. Fortunately for him, he only had to endure seven days because a Red Cross operative from Geneva intervened on his behalf. It would take months for Joseph to get his strength back after being inside of this box, but as soon as he did, he began plotting his next escape. One night, Joseph, along with his three American POW buddies, managed to break through a prison wall and made a mad dash for freedom, but the Nazi prison guards saw it and opened fire on them. All three of Joseph's friends were killed as they ran, but Joseph got away, only to hear the faint barking of the German shepherds the Nazis had sent to hunt him down. So in the freezing cold of Poland in January, Joseph leapt headfirst into a partially frozen river and swam over two miles down it before getting out and running blindly into the woods. Somehow, miraculously, he managed to reach Soviet lines before he froze to death. And there he spoke with battalion commander Alexandra Samosenko, a woman who holds the distinction of being the only female tank commander in all of World War II. Even though Joseph spoke very little Russian, he convinced her to let him join her unit. And so she gave him a gun and some ammunition, and she told him what their next objective was. They were going to liberate the same POW camp he had just escaped from. And so Joseph, alongside the Soviet Red Army that he now fought for, turned around and go smash this POW camp. And after the dust had settled, Joseph raided the main camp office and stole his defiant official POW photo that the Germans had taken of him on the first day he got captured. Joseph continued to fight alongside the Soviets across the Eastern Front for a couple of months. But when a German dive bomber blew up the tank that Joseph was riding on, he was evacuated to a Russian field hospital. There, he received a visit from Georgi Zhukov, the most important Soviet military commander in World War II, who was intrigued by the only non-Soviet in the hospital. He sat with Joseph and learned his story through an interpreter, and then afterwards, he provided Joseph with official paperwork that would allow him to rejoin American forces. And so, in February of 1945, Joseph was sent to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, but unfortunately, when he finally met a friendly American face, after nearly a year of fighting behind enemy lines, they didn't believe his story. They told him that Joseph R. Byerly had been killed in action on June 10, 1944, and that they had already had a funeral mass in his honor in Muskegon, and that his obituary had already been printed in the paper. But despite Joseph painstakingly going through his story over and over again, the ambassador just could not believe what he was hearing. And so worried Joseph might actually be a well-trained German spy, the ambassador sent him to Odessa to have his credentials verified. But Odessa had the same problem and couldn't verify him, so they sent him to Egypt. Egypt had the same problem and they too could not verify his credentials. And so they sent him to Italy, where they finally used fingerprints, and they confirmed that, yes, this is, in fact, Joseph R. Byerly. And so on April 11th, 1945, Joseph returned home, and needless to say, his parents were very surprised to see him because they were convinced he died 10 months earlier. One year later, Joseph would actually get married in the same church that held his funeral mass when everybody believed he was dead. Joseph was given the Purple Heart, and then in the 1990s was given additional presidential awards from U.S. President Bill Clinton as well as the Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Joseph was also given a custom-made AK-47 from the guy who invented the AK-47. Joseph died in 2004 at the age of 81, and his son would go on to become the U.S. Ambassador to Russia under George W. Bush and Barack Obama. 
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please replace all of the Amazon Music Follow Buttons Windex with olive oil. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. If you want to check out our merch, join our Discord server, or just see what's going on at Ballin Studios, head on over to our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So, that's